I, uh, I picked out a, a verse to read, and then hearing what Pastor Mike is preaching, at, I, I had to go back another verse because it fit in perfectly. Uh, it's from Isaiah. It says, Are you not the one who dried up the sea, the waters of the great deep, that made the depths of the sea a road for the redeemed to cross over? So the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing, with everlasting joy on their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness, and sorrow and sighing will flee away. And I think that's a perfect way to start off. We're going to uh, stand together. We're going to sing joy to the world.
We light the candle of joy, and as we do, we remember that Christ is the Savior who will save us from our sins, and that Christ's birth is his good news of great joy for all people. We remember that as we press forward in our world of sorrows and sadness, we can do so with confidence, knowing that in Christ, we have a source of indestructible joy in Christ Jesus, our Lord. When Jesus was born in Bethlehem, the angels brought good news of great joy that will be for all the people. The good news of Jesus' birth gives us great joy today. Luke 2, 8-14. In the same region, there were some shepherds staying out in the fields and keeping watch over their flocks by night. By night. And an angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were, tre- they were terribly frightened. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. Behold, I bring you good news of joy, of great joy, which will be all the people, be for all the people. For today in the city of David there has been for you a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there appeared with an angel a multitude of heavenly hosts, praying, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among men and whom he is pleased. French priest and philosopher Pierre Teilhard de Chardin wrote that joy is the infallible sign of the presence of God. Joy is a profound emotion that issues forth from the depth of our souls and comes from the Holy Spirit. The stories of Advent and Christmas are nothing less than miraculous accounts of joy, unspeakable and full of glory. And we are compelled to respond to the wonders of his love by echoing the words of the familiar Christmas hymn that we just sung. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let everything in earth, heaven, and nature sing. Exceeding great joy is what we celebrate and explore this third week of Advent. Let's read together. Our joy comes from greatest wonder of all, the arrival and the work and the person of Jesus Christ, the Son of God in this world, Spirit of God, open our eyes afresh to the glories of Christ and give us a new taste of your indestructible joy. We worship you singing joy to the world. The Lord is come. Let earth receive her king. Let every heart prepare him in room and heaven and nature sing. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to do something special today, church. Um, This is something we haven't done for a few months now. And uh, we're going to partake in communion. Who's excited for that? Amen. And just so you're aware, we're not um, going against Alberta Health to do this. Um, This is something they've given provision for us to do. And this is something that obviously is extremely important for us as the church. Uh, because this is something we, we're called to do as a church to be continually reminding ourselves of the good news of Jesus Christ. That King Jesus has come to rescue, to redeem, to restore, and he did it through the cross. And so uh, what we're going to do is, is spend some time in reflection, in prayer, in celebration. Uh, we're going to spend some time in prayer together. And... Um, to do that, I'm just going to invite you to stand with me, and we're, we're going to sing, or we're sorry, we're going to read this opening prayer together. 
Let's pray this together. We come to the table of Jesus, our Redeemer. We come to the table humbly, not because we have earned a place here, but because we need mercy and help. We come because Jesus first loved us and gave himself for us. We come because we want to be filled with the Holy Spirit. We come because we want to experience God's grace and love. Amen, church? You guys can be seated. I'm going to call up uh, John and Anthony to serve communion. And, and what they're going to do, um, all this has been sanitized. And uh, we're just going to invite for those of you who are wanting to participate, um, just place out your hand. And John and Anthony will, will provide the elements for you. And, and during this time, just spend time in prayer and reflection. Uh, for those of you who know Jesus, just celebrate his goodness. And for those of you who are perhaps questioning who Jesus is, uh, take that time just to engage that question further in your own mind. But if you are desiring and willing, John and Anthony will come around and place the elements. There will be a cup of bread and then a cup of juice over top of it. This is my body broken for your healing. This is my This is my Forgiveness of your sin. Do this to remember what I've done for you. Do this to remember me. As we partake, what we are doing is, is remembering the past, reflecting on the present, and looking to the future. And, and what we hold in our hands is symbols, reminding ourselves of the body and blood of Christ. 
And as we look back, we, we look upon the crucifixion, the cross of, of Jesus dying on the death on the cross for our sins. And as we examine the present, we sit in the presence that when we confess our sins to Jesus, he is faithful and just to forgive us. And as we look to the future, Jesus says, uh, when we do this, we await to, to drink the wine and eat the bread with him in his Father's kingdom. And we, we await the future of the restoration and renewal of all things. We live with the hope of what is to come. And so as we do so, let's take these elements remembering the past, the present, and the future. I invite you to take the body of Christ with me. Let us take the cup in unity. Jesus, we come before you in celebration of what you've accomplished. We take these elements unified as a church because you are the God that draws us together as one. And as we partake, you are bringing unity among us. We thank you for the gift of your presence. We thank you for the gift of your sacrifice. We thank you for the love that you display to us. And it's in your name that we pray, and in your name we celebrate Jesus Christ, King of kings, Lord of lords, our Savior, our Deliverer, our Rescuer. We thank you, Jesus. Amen? Amen. Let us pray together. I invite you to stand with me. Gracious God, we celebrate the beauty of the cross. We celebrate the welcoming of a loving God. We celebrate access to the holy. We celebrate forgiveness and grace. We celebrate the gift of your presence. Amen, church? Let's continue to celebrate and praise.
Amen. You guys can be seated. I'm going to invite all the kids from ages three to grade three. You guys are dismissed for Children's Church, and uh, Mr. and Mrs. Chachka will meet you guys in the foyer and take you to your classroom, and you guys have fun. Now, for the rest of us, we're going to hang out here and study God's Word. Who's excited for that? Amen, amen. And so we're going to be in a bunch of places this morning, but I'll explain. It's going to be quite a journey we go on. Um, before we get into that, I first of all want to thank Charlie Jackson, Carrie Congo for their wonderful art. Beautiful, hey? It's pretty awesome. And so for those of you wondering what that's for is uh, we call this the season of Advent as the church. And Advent is just a word that means coming, where we celebrate the coming of Jesus Christ God, Savior, Deliverer to this world. And each week we have different artists in our church um, expressed through Canvas, and it's, it's pretty awesome. And I know Car Carrie brought this in this morning, and all I saw was the backside of a little baby, and I was like, Carrie, you painted on the wrong side of the canvas, but <laughs> she explained very quickly, and it looks pretty awesome, eh? Um, so we're going to jump into a, a text, and we're starting this morning on a new sermon series called a weary world rejoices, right? Who recognizes those lyrics from O Holy Night? O Holy Night's the song that we usually sing around Christmas. And, and as I was singing that song, just celebrating, one of these lyrics really stuck out to me. I was like, a weary world rejoices. And I was like, isn't that the message we need right now? And so this is what we're going to be processing for the next three weeks uh, we're going to be looking at stories of, of how God brings rejoicing to our weary world. Now, before we jump into the text, I heard a, a poem last week that I want to share with you. Um, it, it's sort of comical. It's sort of depressing at the same time. But uh, I want to read this. This is, this is called uh, a Christmas COVID poem or something like that. I know we talk a lot about COVID, but this is comical at least. Okay, ready? "'Twas a month before Christmas, and all through the town, people wore masks that covered their frown. The frown had begun way back in the spring when a global pandemic changed everything. They called it corona, but unlike the beer, it didn't bring good time, it didn't bring cheer. Contagious and deadly, this virus spread fast, like a wildfire that starts when fueled by gas. Airplanes were grounded, travel was banned, borders were closed across air, sea, and land. As the world entered lockdown to flatten the curve, the economy halted and folks lost their verve. From March to July, we rode the first wave. People stayed home, they tried to behave. When summer emerged, the lockdown was lifted but away from caution, many folks drifted. Now it's November, obviously it's December now, but in cases are spiking. Wave two has arrived, much to our disliking. Frontline workers, doctors and nurses, try to save people from riding in hearses. And thank you for all your healthcare workers. This has been a beautiful time for you guys. We just celebrate you. The virus is awful. This COVID-19, there isn't a cure. There is no vaccine. At least we'll see now. It's true that this year has sadness of plenty. We'll never forget the year 2020. And just round the corner, the holiday season. But why be merry? Is there even one reason? Interesting, eh? And so we, we realize that the world is very weary right now, and yet we, we enter a season that is supposed to be all about joy, isn't it? And so how does this dichotomy work in our life? Why do we have Christians, even in a weary world, have something to rejoice about? And the Sunday school answer is, Jesus, good job. <laughs> We're going to go much deeper than that. But yeah, the answer is Jesus. Simply, Jesus is the reason why we can have rejoicing even in the midst of sorrow and uncertainty and confusion and chaos. And so all these Christmas songs that we sing have to do with the celebration of joy. They have to do with rejoicing. And so 
We're in this year of rejoicing, the season, or sorry, the season of rejoicing, and yet our year has been feelings of isolation. It has been feelings of worry and anxiety and fear, and all these things have overcome our culture, and yet we as a church are still going to rejoice. Amen? Amen. And let's discover why, why we have reasons for rejoicing. And what I want to talk about today is joy in the wilderness. Now, there's a few passages I could go to from here, but what I really want to do is begin to look at the story of the Exodus. Now, you may be asking, why are you talking about Exodus during Christmas? The answer will come later on, but there's a deep connection that I'm going to make to how the story of Christ incarnate has to deal with the Exodus story. But we're going to jump into the Exodus story first of all. And and the reason for that is the Exodus is one of the major storylines of Scripture. Um, One of the most quoted stories of the New Testament uh, in the New Testament is the story of the Exodus. Now, we have to discover why that is. What's the purpose behind all this quotation? And as we study the story, I'm going to bring out a few things, and I'm going to talk about some of the wilderness journey after the Exodus, and I really want to bring out this concept that there's, there's times in history and there's times in our life that when we go through the wilderness, as much as it hurts, as, as difficult as it is, the wilderness can become a gift of joy when it leads us to dependence upon God, Okay? The wilderness can become a gift of joy when it leads us to dependence upon God. That's what we're going to be exploring together this morning. So, the story of the Exodus. Um, What are we talking about? Which people group are we talking about and where are they? We're talking about the Israelites and where are they? They're in Egypt. They're in captivity right there. They're in slavery there. There's all this struggle that the people are experiencing. They're crying out to God to deliver them, to rescue them. And it's this massive story of remembering how God was faithful to them. And so the Israelites, they're suffering in Egypt. Uh, God raises up who to lead them out of Egypt? He raises up Moses. Moses leads his people out of Egypt under the guidance of God. And the people are set free, they're delivered, they're rescued from Egypt, they're rescued from slavery. Now that's a really summarized story, but I want to jump a little further along into the story. Because what happens next to me is one of the most fascinating things in this story. And so, what do we have? As soon as the people come out of Exodus, as soon as they escape from Egypt and God is delivered of the first thing they do is praise and worship God. And and this is interesting. In Exodus 15, this is actually one of the first times in Scriptures that we see mention of praise and worship of God. It's it's really the first worship song in the Bible. And and this is how the people began. It says, Moses and the people of Israel sang this song to the Lord, this first worship song in Scripture, saying, I will sing to the Lord. For he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song. And he has become my what? My salvation, right? This is actually the first time salvation is referred to in the scripture. This is my God and I will praise him. My father's God and I will exalt him. And the song continues of praising God. This is the first worship song we have in the Bible, okay? So the initial posture of the people as they come out of the exodus is what? It's praise, worship, celebration. Everyone's happy. Everyone's joyous, right? Now, as they sing that song, as they've entered out from Egypt, where do they enter into? Does anyone know? They enter into the desert wilderness, They enter into the desert wilderness. So they have this joy. They're experiencing all these beautiful things. But then what happens next in the story? You guys can turn your Bibles at Exodus 15, verses 22 to 27. And this is what happens. I want to walk us through the story, and then I'm going to connect it back to the story of Jesus incarnate. 
But it says, Then Moses made Israel set out from the Red Sea. And so what was the miraculous event that happened at the Red Sea? God parted the water, this miraculous event, God authority over creation. The people were rescued through the Red Sea, right? And they went into the wilderness of Shur. They went three days in the wilderness and they found no what? No water. When they came to Marah, they could not drink the the water of Marah because it was bitter. Therefore, it was named Marah. (laughs) So it's great language of the Hebrews, right? (laughs) And the people grumbled against Moses saying, what shall we drink? Okay, let's process this for a second. These are a people who have just been rescued from captivity, been rescued from slavery. They've been set free. One of the ways they were set free was being miraculously led through the Red Sea where God showed his power and authority over what? Over water, over nature, right? And three days later, after they sing their nice little praise song, They're walking through the desert three days later, and what are they complaining to God and grumbling about? No water. Isn't that crazy to comprehend? Literally, they just experienced one of the most um, wild stories of God's rescue and deliverances of the Old Testament that was repeated over and over again to talk about God's faithfulness, and three days later, they're already complaining and grumbling about what shall we drink. And so we, we got complaining, we got grumbling. It's been three days. Now, that's a long time, but still, what's going on here? I want to read the rest, and then we're going to process a little bit more. And so Moses, as the people are complaining and grumbling, this is what Moses does. He cries to the Lord. Moses cries out to God. Rescue us again. And the Lord shows Moses a log. Now, that's, trees is a massive theme in Scripture. Rebecca and I have been having a lot of fun with that lately. I'll probably address it a little later, but he showed him a log. And what did Moses have to do to this log? He threw it into the water, and then the water became sweet. In other words, it wasn't bitter, it wasn't undrinkable, now it was actually drinkable, right? Right? And there the Lord made for them a statue and a rule, which is covenant language. And there he tested them, saying, If you will diligently listen to the voice of the Lord your God, and do that which is right in his eyes, and give ear to his commandments, and keep all statues, I will put none of the diseases on you that I put on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord your what? Your healer. Then they came to Elim where there were 12 springs of water and 70 palm streams, and they encamped there by the water. There's an important part there I'll address later. And so in this text, we we read that God is doing something with his people here. God, God has rescued him, he's delivered them, and now he puts before them a what? What does the passage tell us? He puts before them a A test. He's testing the people. He's saying, will you actually be reminded of my faithfulness? Are you going to trust me to provide for you? Are you going to trust me to take care of you? And the question rooms, are they going to trust God to provide for them even after all the miraculous things he's done for them? And the answer is no. (laughs) What's their response? What are the people doing? Grumbling and complaining, right? Right? They've already lost sight of what God is doing. Now, these people had just experienced all these things, and yet they're still grumbling and complaining. And yet Moses, what do we see Moses do? He is, what's Moses doing? He's interceding. He's praying. He's crying out to God. He's saying, rescue us again. He's asking God to be faithful as he was before. And so Moses trusts God. And so the whole point of this is this is this test that is set before the people. And who's the only one who passed the test? Moses. Okay? Yet the tree becomes salvation. Now, 
The people fail the test as they go through it. Yet Moses passes the test. So I set this story up because I, I want to bring now the Exodus story to ourselves and, and our response to rescue and deliverance from that. So time out there. This is sort of a mental pause break. Now I'm going to address the question, well, what does the Exodus story have to do with Christmas? What does it have to do with Christmas? Oh, here we go. Well, when we look at the beginning of the Gospel of Mark, who here has read the Gospel of Mark before? When we talk about the incarnation of Jesus and the coming of Jesus, most of the time when we study it, we look at the beginning of the Gospel accounts, right? And I want to look at how does Mark handle this because Mark sets up his whole Gospel account, especially at the beginning, to parallel, guess what story the Old Testament? The? The Exodus. Let's say that together. What story does Mark parallel in his Gospel? The? The Exodus, okay? And so something's going on here. Now, now how do we know that Mark is paralleling the story of the Exodus? Well, first of all, the first character we're introduced to in the Gospel of Mark is who? I, well, yeah, the quotient, quotation of Isaiah, but, but who's, who's making that quotation? John the, John the Baptist, right? And, and so this is how Mark begins the Gospel. It says, the beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God... As it was written by Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send your, my messenger before your face who will prepare your way. Who's that referring to? John the Baptist, right? The voice of the one crying where? In the wilderness. Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his paths straight. Okay? So first of all, in the Gospel of Mark, what we see is this Mark is connecting John the Baptist in a similar way to the angel of the Exodus. And John is preparing the way of the Lord just as the angel of the Lord was preparing the way for the people. Okay? So there's that parallel. Now, process this with me as well. Where is John the Baptist baptizing people? The River of Jordan. The River of Jordan. When did the wanderings of the Exodus, what place did it end? The Jordan River, right? There's another connection. Now, let's process a little deeper, right? Um, Jesus, he passes through what water? The Jordan River. And guess what? We have the parallel of the Israelites. What do they pass through? The Red Sea. And what do we see Jesus doing as a baptism? Passing through the Jordan River. Okay? You making those connections? Now, keep process with me. The story of the Exodus is the first time in Scripture that the Israelites are referred to as God's sons, His children, okay? When Jesus is baptized, how does God refer to Jesus? His beloved son. Another connection there, okay? You guys following me? Okay, okay, good. <laughs> You can tell me. No, I can slow down if you want. But we also see who leads the Israelites through the wilderness. Well, Moses, but the Spirit of God, right? Cloud of, cloud of right and fire. The Spirit of God is leading the Israelites through the wilderness. Who leads Jesus into the wilderness? The Spirit of God. How long are the Israelites left in the wilderness? How many days is Jesus in the wilderness? Are you guys getting the connection? You following me here? Keep processing. So here we have Jesus, especially in the Gospel of Mark, we see this parallel to the story of Exodus. And, and what this is saying is that what Jesus does is he brings in a new Exodus. And he brings in a greater exodus. And see, what's, what's beautiful is when we even compare the stories, when, even when we look at the Red Sea parting, when we see the Red Sea parting for the Israelites, not only do we see Jesus coming through the water, but what is split open at Jesus' baptism? The heavens. The heavens are open. 
Um, so all we see, Jesus, Jesus comes through the wilderness. And did the Israelites fail temptation in the wilderness? Yeah, many times, right? Many times they failed testing. But yet when Jesus is led through the wilderness, does he fail at all? No. He's perfect in temptation. Jesus is the one who, who really gives the ultimate picture of the kingdom of God, which we've been talking a lot about. And so uh, I want you to have it in your minds when, when we talk about the beginning of the gospel of Mark, make the connection between the Exodus story and the new Exodus of Jesus, okay? So when we celebrate Christmas, and I know we, we probably, you haven't probably haven't heard this at all, but when we celebrate Christmas, we're celebrating a new Exodus, Amen. Now, I'm going to talk about the significance of that later, but that's what we're celebrating, the new exodus that Jesus has brought, that Jesus has brought in. So let's, let's just look at more parallels now that it has to do with our own life. When the Egyptians are defeated and the Israelites are brought out of Egypt, what do we call that? What's, being, what's happening to them? Liberation, right? They're being set free. They were in slavery, they were in bondage, and now they have complete freedom, right? When we talk about the new exodus, what does the Bible tell us? We are slaves to what? Slaves to sin. We are in bondage to our sin. Sin controls us, sin overwhelms us, sin defeats us. And yet in the new exodus, what happens? We are set free from... Sin, right? And so a greater exodus, something more profound is happening. Now, what's interesting to you, get this language now. Um, in the Exodus story, God passes his judgment over people when what, what do they do to their doors? Does anyone remember? Yeah, they put the blood of a lamb around the post, right? And God's judgment over, comes over them. And skips over them. Now, how are we saved? The blood of Christ. The blood of the Lamb. You see that parallel? Okay. There's a lot of parallels here. I know it's a lot to process, but we can keep going. Okay. God saves us and places in th into this new covenant. Right? Even in the story of Exodus 15 there, when the people are, have no water, Jesus is doing a covenant before the covenant even comes. Or, sorry, uh, God has established with Moses a covenant before the covenant even comes, and yet with Jesus we have a perfect covenant, a new covenant based on his sacrifice. Now, here, here's a wild thing too. I'll end with this thought because I know it's a lot, probably too much for you to process right now, but it's okay. You can tell I spent too much st time studying this this week. One more thought on this. When the people go through the wilderness and they're wandering for 40 years, uh, what are they longing for? What are they awaiting for? The promised land, right? The promised land. Now, Jesus, on the other hand, as we walk through the wilderness of this world, he's leading us to what? The promised land, and what do we call that? We've been talking about this a lot. Not heaven, the kingdom of God, Right? He's leading us to this promised land, the kingdom of God, where all things are renewed and reconciled. And so you see how the, the, the beginning of the story of Jesus has everything to do with the language of Exodus? Does that make sense? Okay. So the question then, what I really want to spend time on is with that connection, this is where the passage in, in Exodus 15 really put me in a profound thought. The question that becomes, if Jesus has led us through a new exodus, and if we as the people of God are, are being led by Jesus in this new exodus, I think the question we really need to be addressing in life is how do we respond to the tests of the wilderness? Does that make sense? When we look at Exodus 15, even after the people were praising God 
How long did it take them to start complaining and grumbling? Three days, right? And yet for those of us who know the exodus, the freedom, the salvation, the rescue, the deliverance of Jesus Christ, will we do the same? See, the reality is we're all going to be walking through this wilderness of life, and unless we allow it to force us to depend on God, we will constantly be living and grumbling and complaining. And yet, what is it supposed to do? It's supposed to lead us into rejoicing, into song, into celebration, right? That's what we see initially as they, they exit. They're celebrating. There's a worship. There's praise. And yet that praise quickly turns to grumbling. And so what are some of the reasons for that? I want to talk about, well, what is, what is preventing us from rejoicing. And I think these stories really give us a little bit of insight of, of what prevents us from rejoicing in this weary world, what prevents us from rejoicing in the wilderness. And, and one of the first things that we realize is in the story, one of the first things that prevents them from rejoicing and stops them from rejoicing is they forget what? They forget what God had done. Three days ago, (laughs) they had already forgotten this miraculous event of God's deliverance to the point where the very thing that God showed authority and power over water is the exact same thing that they're complaining about three days later, right? And, and, And what does that mean for us? It means we can so easily and quickly forget God's faithfulness, can't we? We can so easily and quickly forget God's goodness, can't we? We can so easily forget God's salvation in our lives. And we completely lose sight of God's faithfulness and the way we can trust and depend on Him to provide for us. Forgetfulness of God's past salvation leads to grumbling in the present. And we lose any sense of rejoicing when we forget what God has done, how God has been faithful in our lives, how God has taken care of us, how God has provided for us, how God has sustained us. As soon as we lose sight on that, we lose sight of all our joy. See, it's interesting that when we read Psalm 105, uh, Psalm 105 is this psalm that basically walks through a lot of the story of Israel It walks through the story of the exodus and deliverance and the wilderness wandering. And what I've always found fascinating about that psalm is is we get to verse 43. And it's interesting. The the psalmist says that God brought his people out of the wilderness, out of the exodus. And it says he brought them out with rejoicing. Interesting. Interesting. Rejoicing and shouts of what? Can you guess? Shouts of joy. In other words, when when the people remembered what God had done, when they remembered God's faithfulness, when they remembered how God provided for them, how God had sustained them, how, how God has displayed His love and care and concern for them, what did it lead to? It led to rejoicing. It led to shouts of joy. And so we have to remember what God is doing. Now, that's the first thing that the wilderness can steal our joy from, is forgetfulness. So don't be forgetful, church, amen? The second thing that the wilderness really reveals and steals away is a a true sense of character, doesn't it? (laughs) I mean, the character of the people were really revealed. The character of Moses was really revealed in the season of wilderness. And what this reveals is where we're actually finding our true sense of joy. See, often when we're going through this wilderness, and I mean even we could look at this season, uh, this season is one where a lot of character has been tested, right? Who here has found their character tested during the season? 
<laughs> Who's seen a lot of characters exposed during the season? <laughs> right? Whenever trials, whenever hardship, whenever difficult decisions come, the first thing that is exposed is our character. Who we truly are, what we truly believe, how we truly act. And when life is going comfortable and at ease, none of that gets tested. And yet Jesus places, or God places this test before the Israelites, saying, you know what? I'm going to show you my faithfulness. I'm going to show you my power. And then I'm going to put you in a situation where that's going to get tested. And if you are faithful and if you trust me and if you believe me for what I say and how I provide for you, there's going to be a positive result. If you don't trust me, your life is going to be what? One of grumbling and complaining. Who feels much joy when they're grumbling and complaining? Anyone? No. <laughs> you can't be happy and dancing while you're complaining about life, right? Or complaining about other people or whatever it may be. It, it doesn't work. And, and so there's this choice here. You either find joy in God or you look at your circumstances and live in grumbling and complaining. Now, what's beautiful here, again, is what is Moses doing? He's interceding. He's praying on behalf of the people. He, he's passing the test for the people. And, and something absolutely wonderful comes as a result of this. Something absolutely beautiful comes of this, where God establishes a relationship with the people once again, and God leads them as Moses cries for deliverance. He leads them where? Does anyone remember? They came to Elim, and what was in Elim? Springs, right? Now, now here's important. We, we have to process this together. There were how many springs of water? Twelve, okay? There's importance there. Now, how many palm trees? Seventy, okay? Something is being said here. How many tribes of Israel were there at this point? Twelve. How many descendants of Jacob entered into Egypt? Seventy, right? And, and what is happening here is God is saying, when you cry out to me for deliverance, I will provide. And it's this beautiful picture of God providing for everyone. There's 12 tribes, which means each tribe has its own spring of water. There's 70 palm trees to shade and provide shelter representing all the descendants that entered into Egypt. And the statement that's being made here is that when you trust me in the wilderness, I will provide everything for you. Now, do you think the people were happy and rejoicing against once they got here? For maybe for a little bit. <laughs> the gr grumbling started very soon after as we read through Exodus more. But there was this glimmer of, of hope. There was this glimmer of rejoicing. Why? Because God had provided for them because Moses interceded on their behalf. And so there's, there's these times where our, our character is going to get tested and the, the character that we have can either lead us into grumbling and despair and complaint. But when we cry out to God and when we trust Him, when we depend upon Him, when we follow what He desires from us, that's where we're led to times of rejoicing, times of celebration. Even in the midst of the wilderness, even in the midst of a weary world, God provides rejoicing. Now, here's the beautiful thing. When we, when we bring this back to the story of Christ, when we bring this back to the story of Christmas and the gospel, the only source of true, lasting joy is found in the new exodus. It's found in Jesus Christ. No matter what circumstance we go through, there's always reason for rejoicing. Because whatever we go through in life, there's truths that remain. There's truths that cannot be overridden. One of those truths is 
We as God's people, we are delivered from the sentence of death. We have life with Christ. In Jesus Christ, in the new exodus, does sin have any hold on us anymore? No. We can find freedom in Christ. God provides a way when there's no way. He destroys the enemy of sin and death on our behalf so that we can live in the freedom and rejoicing that only He can provide. He provides for us as we walk through this world, as we wait for the new heavens and the new earth, the fruition of the kingdom of God. He is with us, and He sustains us, and He provides for us. And so we have reasons to rejoice, amen, church? And and so as we we enter into this Christmas season, my, my hope for us is that, first of all, we'd be reminded and that we'd be reflective on God's promises and God's faithfulness in the past. That's why I want to start with the Exodus story because it's reminding us of how God has been faithful to deliver His people, which Mark continues in his gospel to remind us of the very same thing. And as we go through the wilderness, we have to realize that we're going to be tested Our character is going to be tested. Our trust is going to be tested. Our resolve is going to be tested. All these things, and and instead of acting like the people wandering through the wilderness, complaining and grumbling, let's all be like Moses, amen, who cry out to God in dependence upon God for rescue, for redemption, for renewal. That is going to bring rejoicing among us. Amen, church? Amen. Let's pray to that end. Gracious God, we come before you, Lord, in the midst of the wilderness of this world. Lord, we see chaos, we see uncertainty, we see confusion all around us. And yet, Lord, the joy that we have in you remains because you have led us through a new exodus. You have brought rescue. You have brought redemption. You have brought freedom from slavery and sin. You have brought life from death. You have provided all these things. And and Lord, in you, when we focus on you, when we look to you, when we trust you, Lord, rejoicing is found. True rejoicing, lasting rejoicing is found. And Lord, I pray that we as your church would realize it's when we lose our focus on you, when we When we live in grumbling and complaint, that's when sorrow comes. That's when misery comes. That's when doubt comes. That's where forgetfulness comes. And so be with us, your people, and inspire us by the power of your Holy Spirit to walk through this season rejoicing. Walk through this life rejoicing. Not dependent upon our circumstances, but dependent on your character and your faithfulness, and your love, and your provision, and your deliverance, and your freedom. We thank you for that gift. We thank you for the gift of rejoicing. We thank you that you are a source of joy. In you we celebrate. In you we praise. Thank you, gracious God. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen, church? Amen. I'm going to invite Joel to come up, and I'm going to invite you to stand as we continue in celebration.
is rejoicing because of our God. Amen? Amen. Amen. Um, I want a few announcements, and then I'm going to share a quick thought with you as we leave from here. Uh, The first announcement for you guys is, first of all, uh, Adel and Layla. Uh, Who remembers Adel and Layla? Uh, They came to do a a mission seminar for us here, and uh, they serve at the Middle Eastern Friendship Center down in Surrey, B.C. Uh, They also have programming that goes out to um, Al Hayat TV, where they're trying to broadcast um, to Muslim nations. And so they've been raising money for a recording studio. Uh, I think right now they have to fly. Is it Sweden they're flying to right now? Well, obviously not now, but Finland they were flying to before to record in the studio. And so we're trying to help them get one set up in the lower mainland. And so, so far uh, we've raised 5,543.36 cents dollars, church. Amen. Amen. We, we just want to thank you guys on behalf of the missions board for helping and serving and being generous in that capacity. Um, and as you enter the new year, just keep them on your minds for donations as well. Uh, another announcement we want to make this week is uh, our Christmas service eve times are going to be right now at 6 and 8 p.m. Now, with government regulations, we're only allowed one-third capacity at this point. And so what we're going to have is sign up for those services. Um, And so what this does is open up the opportunity that if you want to invite friends, if you want to invite family, um, which I'm hoping that you do, again, some of your uh, friends that you've been talking about faith with and wrestling with faith with, um, bring them here that night and uh, sign up for that. We're going to send out registration for that soon just to make sure that we're we're staying at the one-third capacity for those services but we'll send out information for that. Christmas Eve, 6 and 8 at this time. Okay, I think that's it for announcements. Um, I want to share with you just one more thought. Um, Philippians 2 stood out to me as I was looking at Exodus 15 and the people complaining and grumbling. And and Paul Paul says this. He says, do all things without grumbling or disputing. Is this a common issue in Scripture? I think so, right? Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, So that in the day of Christ, I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. And Paul is speaking. He says, even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad. And what does he do with them? And he rejoices with them. Likewise, you should also be glad and rejoice with me. And so here he gives these sort of eight reasons that why we can be glad and rejoice. We can rejoice and be glad because we can stop grumbling and complaining because we have something to rejoice in. We can start being blameless and innocent because we have a God who brings that to us through Jesus. We can stop being part of a crooked and twisted generation. Why? Because we are now a kingdom of priests. You can start being the children of God without blemish and shine as lights because God has adopted us. We can stop living in ways that are in vain because God has given us a meaning and a purpose. We can start living in ways that we can be proud of living in godly ways. We can stop cheerlessness and we can start rejoicing. Why? Because of Jesus. Amen, church? Because of the new exodus that he provides. Go in that reality. Go in that rejoicing. God bless you all this week.